Ever wondered just how deep Star Trek goes? Do you spend your time thinking about the Trek multiverse? Hi, my name is Kyle, and this is Trek Expertise, where we discuss all things Trek. Today, a bit of a serious topic. Native Americans in Star Trek. How are they represented? What does that representation mean? And how does it connect with the rest of the Trek multiverse? There are special problems associated with representations of Native Americans in popular American culture. To understand those problems, you have to know something of the history and context of Native America. First of all, Native American presence in North and South America is very old, dating between 40,000 and 16,500 years ago. Second, it is important to note that there isn't a singular Native American culture or people. When we describe Native America, we are referring to a dizzying array of nations and peoples that, at the time of European contact, existed in various configurations from loosely networked farming villages and communities to full-on imperial civilizations. Third, the portrayal of Native America in popular American media is a direct result of a history of cultural and state-sponsored bias and centuries of antagonistic behavior that at various times was imperial or genocidal on the part of the United States and other European powers. Underpinning all this indirectly are great plagues of European diseases that swept away the majority of human life in the Western Hemisphere upon contact, the scope of which has not been seen before or since in a process that is still underway deep in the Amazon. Some Americans may not like this assessment of our history, but I assure you that if you spend some time with it, you'll find that Euro-American treatment of Native American nations to be some of the darkest, bloodiest, most heart-wrenching, and most surprising chapters in the history of all humankind. The negative portrayal of Native America in media for a long, long time is one of the stupid animal-like savage, a lesser subspecies who stood in as villains against the righteous Euro-Americans on the frontier, blocking the path of God-ordained civilized society. Wearing limited clothing, carrying simple weapons, barely capable of speech, they raped and pillaged according to animal instincts. This is not only offensive, but seriously, wildly, cartoonishly misinformed. The more recent positive portrayals of Native Americans paint them as noble savages, both highly spiritual and wise, stoic, and so in tune with the natural order that they possess something European-based peoples had lost, a special magical innocence. Both of these portrayals are dead wrong, for a host of reasons that, quite honestly, you can build a career studying and explaining. Native America is vastly more complex, more surprising, and far more integral to the various legal and cultural concepts in American identity than your high school history class led you to believe. If you check out the subspace below, you'll find some links and info that will satiate your curiosity on this matter. If you are an American and are watching this, I especially encourage you to get to know your true American heritage. It's deeper in time and richer in scope than you can imagine. So how does Star Trek handle this hugely complex topic? Well, with mixed results. There are moments of rampant insensitivity, moments of classic science fiction wit and possibility, and then there are moments you'd almost swear writers are being intentionally racist. Star Trek begins its representation of Native America with the original series episode, The Paradise Syndrome. <sighs> Where to begin with this one? First of all, there is a reductionist attitude here in that the plot specifies that a group of advanced aliens called the Preservers scooped up some Delaware, Navajo, and Mohican peoples and deposited them on some distant world where the USS Enterprise will eventually encounter them. Three distinct cultures of people summed up into one, just as a general American audience at the time might have tried to perceive them, and indeed as some Americans perceive them today. This would be like randomly selecting some Japanese, Scottish, and Kenyan peoples, depositing them in a room and hoping for the best. You might get lucky, but there is no promise that all will go well. Native American cultures were not necessarily compatible with other Native American cultures due to their respective Native Americanness. Also on display in this episode are attitudes about the simplicity of the lives of American Indians who are living in an obvious paradise. Shouldn't we contact them, Jim? Tell them? Tell them what? That an asteroid's coming to smash their world into atoms? Too primitive to grasp the concept of space flight, Doctor. Our appearance here would only serve to confuse and frighten them. What's the matter, Jim? What? Oh, nothing. Just so peaceful. Uncomplicated, no problems, no command decisions. The depiction of Native Americans as dim-witted, seriously, one character could not figure out how to remove a shirt, and the complete and total misrepresentation of the spiritual beliefs and religions of any of the Delaware, Mohican, or Navajo descendants featured in the episode. And let's say nothing of the costumes or possibly the ancestry of the actors portraying these Native characters. 
What gets me is that Kirk and company assume that the inhabitants of this planet would not understand what an asteroid is and choose not to tell them of their impending demise without talking to any of them. I don't know about you, but if I ever bumped into humans of any stripe on a planet other than Earth, I'm going to assume that they are fully versed in the existence of space rocks. The white savior stereotype is also on full display here, a persistent style of story that has been present in North American fiction from colonial times through to today, found in modern films such as Apocalypto and Avatar. Kirk is worshipped as an all-knowing god, which is very much a holdover from the ethnocentristic attitudes of a bygone pre-electric American era. Kirk also knows how to build irrigation systems, a lamp, and other wonders, like how to administer CPR that the Native Americans apparently are too simple to know about. And when they figure out he isn't a god, they immediately react with violence. A return to the whole negative portrayal of American media stereotype we mentioned earlier. All in all, this episode is an example of typical representations of Native Americans in television and film at the time, which was racist in the truest sense of the term. Horrifically, unabashedly racist. This might be the most race or culture insensitive episode in the entire franchise, I suspect. Moving on to the animated series. This is where we get Star Trek's first ever Native American crew member, Ensign Dawson Walking Bear, in the episode How Sharper Than a Serpent's Tooth. In the tradition of who mourns for Aeneas and Star Trek V's treatment of how some gods are actually aliens who visited pre-warp Earth for various reasons, this animated episode deals with the fact that Kukukan, the Maya version of Quetzalcoatl, the goodly feathered serpent of learning and knowledge is actually an alien who visited Earth in the past and influenced some of the humans there, specifically the Maya. We aren't completely enlightened yet. There is still a negative bias here, specifically with the idea that the Maya needed alien intervention. In the episode, the alien Kukukan admits to giving the Maya their calendar and handing out knowledge about architecture and agriculture. Turns out there's a long tradition of this sort of thing by European-based peoples toward the peoples of the Western Hemisphere. In a specific case, when Europeans initially studied the Maya ruins in Central America, they assumed that the Maya, who were thick on the ground there, then as well as now, could not have possibly built the structures. They suggested all kinds of wild alternate theories for the existence of Maya civilization that purposely left the Maya out. This happened for all archaeological ruins in North America, including the Anasazi and the extensive Mississippian civilization. As a side note, Kukukan, as represented here, is sorely lacking as a character. His motivations, his anger, it's all a little too dimensional and uninspired. Just the tip of the iceberg of a larger Trek-based villain problem, which we'll get to in a future episode. What is excellent about this episode is Ensign Walking Bear, the episode's helmsman, who, in the midst of the writers removing agency from the entire Maya civilization and giving it to some dim-witted alien being, is busy exhibiting some agency himself. Never mind that Ensign Walking Bear identifies as Comanche, and claims Aztec and Maya cultures as, quote, his people, another moment of reductionism, and never mind that the ensign is referred to by his translated English name instead of his actual name in Comanche, a practice that we only impose on Native American languages. It's just plain cool and very Star Trek to see a Native American character steering the ship and exhibiting intelligence and problem-solving activity on a Starfleet crew decades before we get Chakotay of Voyager. I bet Ensign Walking Bear could figure out how to remove his own shirt. The next time we see Native Americans in Star Trek is in the very first film, my favorite, the motion picture. What's that? You missed that scene? It's right here. See? Right there. And here too. Now one thing we can note in the Star Trek multiverse is the existence of the monoculture issue. That is, every alien species is represented as coming from a singular culture. Now, there are lots of exceptions to this, but generally it is true, and generally, to a lesser extent, even humanity is represented in such a way. So why are these American Indian Starfleet personnel in the motion picture allowed to exhibit dress from their specific human culture? I think this was a simple, classic Star Trek moment, where the writers wanted to say one of two things. One, to echo the Vulcan infinite diversity in infinite combinations philosophy, and saying humanity in the future becomes enormously more tolerant of its own cultural variations, and two, that Native America, a collection of humans who have undergone the most obscene and horrific discriminations imaginable, not only survive into the future, but retain their heritage in the process. Compared to previous Trek commentary on Native America, this small cameo has been the most positive and most Star Trek yet. Pre-launch countdown will commence in 40 minutes. The next franchise treatment of Native America we get is the episode Journey's End of the Next Generation. A full 15 years after the motion picture opened in theaters and 26 years since the Paradise Syndrome aired on television. 
Although this episode centers around Wesley and the Traveler, it is the first time in Star Trek that a more or less contemporary issue concerning Native America is dealt with head on. In this episode, Captain Picard is ordered by Starfleet to facilitate the removal of the descendants of American Indians that left Earth and settled on a planet called Dorvan V, near the contentious border with the Cardassian Empire. Your mission will be to evacuate the colony on Dorvan V. Dorvan V? Isn't that where the group of North American Indians settled? Yes. They've been there for about 20 years. They've established a village in a small valley on the southern continent. Something wrong? Admiral, centuries ago, these North American Indians were forcibly displaced from their ancestral lands. These settlers on Dorvan V originally left Earth more than 200 years ago in order to preserve their cultural identity. I am aware of that, Captain. You see, Admiral, there are some very disturbing historical parallels here. Once more, they are being asked to leave their homes because of a a political decision that has been taken by a distant government. An Indian representative was included in the deliberations at the Federation Council. His objections were noted, discussed, but ultimately rejected. Captain, the Indians on Dorvan are a nomadic group that have settled there only 20 years ago, and at that time, they were warned that the planet was hotly disputed by the Cardassians. The bottom line is they never should have gone there in the first place. Granted. But to go to them now, after 20 years, and ask them to leave what is now their home. No episode of Star Trek before or since approaches issues directly related to contemporary Native Americans with such seriousness and sensitivity of tone. Despite seven years of Chakotay working on Voyager after this episode originally aired, Journey's End is possibly a kind of high point of the discussion of Native Americans in Star Trek. What is also interesting in this episode is that Native American characters enter permanently into the Star Trek context in this episode, becoming active participants in the Cardassian Federation border issue, and becoming part of the background story for the rise of the Maquis. Chakotay of Voyager comes from this part of the galaxy, maybe from this very colony, and is, as a result, himself drawn into the Maquis fight. Also, in the famously near monoculture-like human race of the 23rd and 24th centuries, these particular Native American people on Dorvan V represent a unique oddity in the Trek multiverse. Other human characters have held on to specific human traditions of one sort or another, or of traits respective of certain Earth cultures. However, more or less, humanity is presented on purpose as a unified whole who have worked out any issues that might relate to cultural disagreements. No humans illustrated in Star Trek have been as conservative in their own preservation as the Native Americans of Dorvan V. It is a very interesting reminder that the Federation is a free society and that humanity might contain significant cultural diversity well into the 24th century. More evidence of this might be found on Caldos 2 of the TNG episode Sub Rosa and Bringaloid 5 of TNG's Up the Long Ladder. As a result of Journey's End, Native Americans represent in some aspect a part of the fictional and political landscape of the Alpha Quadrant. Just like Cardassians and Klingons, we certainly may bump into these Native American characters again. Of course, the biggest problem with this episode, as with all episodes so far, is that of reductionism, of assuming that Native Americans all represent one group. We don't know exactly which nation of people settled Dorvan V because the cultural representations the show's creators are using are jumbled up. Note that this is not an issue Star Trek has with other Earth-based cultures. Oh, and elements of the white savior narrative can be found here too. As proof of this new status for Native Americans as active participants in the Star Trek multiverse, we get the pinnacle of Star Trek's discussion concerning Native America. Commander Chakotay of Star Trek Voyager. Chakotay is an interesting character in that he is loved by some fans and reviled by others. However, irrespective of how you feel about the character himself, please note that in classic Trek tradition, the inclusion of a Native American on the bridge of a starship is as brilliant an endorsement as one can imagine in the Trek multiverse. This is thoughtful of you, Tuvok, but my tribe never used bows and arrows, and I've never even shot one. All the things that were said in Journey's End have been continued with Chakotay. That Native Americans are alive and well in the future, that they survive culturally, and that they are active participants on the galactic stage. Chakotay is a member of the Maquis when Voyager begins, as a result of his people's involvement with the Cardassian border, possibly the specific involvement of Dorvan V, although Chakotay was born before the planet was settled. But despite his allegiance, Chakotay's background is very conflicted. He rejected his traditional culture at the dismay of his father. 
I don't suppose you have any theories that might explain this. I can give you an official rubber tree people theory, if you like. Sky spirits. Sky spirits? It's an ancient myth. Sky spirits from above created the first rubber people in their own image and led the way to a sacred land where the rubber people would live for eternity. You obviously don't put a great deal of faith in this explanation. How much faith do you put in Adam and Eve? Hasn't science proved that all humans developed from a single evolutionary process? That's what I was always taught. On the other hand, none of my teachers ever spent much time in the Delta Quadrant. He joined Starfleet. He became a scientist. He has a promising career as a Starfleet officer when he switched allegiances from Starfleet to the Maquis after his father died in order to help his people and to honor his father's memory. Even in that little bit of information, we divorce Native America from the idea that they are slaves to their own culture, a stereotype that continues to perpetuate itself in present-day America. Here is a Native person who doesn't know what is true and what is not, and has spent his life exploring those implications for himself. He makes decisions based on the context around him, a hallmark of every single individual and every single human culture that has ever existed. This conflicted perspective on what to do with Native cultural traditions and beliefs and how to interact with the rest of society is an issue at the very heart of the post-contact Native American experience. Today, Native Americans of all stripes are answering this very question in all sorts of ways. Trapped on a barren planet, and you're stuck with the only Indian in the universe who can't start a fire by rubbing two sticks together. What is a little less interesting, okay, a lot less interesting, is the representation of Chakotay's specific culture. Admittedly, it's a little watered down, perhaps insultingly so. All right, it's so jumbled up that it's offensive, even to me, a non-native. For example, is Chakotay Maya? If so, then why is he using his Akuna, a replacement for peyote, to induce visions? Peyote is an implement of the American Southwest. Maya culture used to induce visions via ritualized fasting and bloodletting. How cool would that have been? If every time Chicote had a life problem, he stopped eating and pierced his tongue or genitals to release blood. Kind of makes Worf look soft, huh? Regardless, Chicote's represented heritage is a jumbled mess that writers have either purposely mixed up or did so inadvertently. While time and again the writers point us toward a Maya cultural origin, they continuously inserted Navajo sand painting references, Northern Plains Great Spirit references, a sort of spoof on native Californian face tattoos, and American Southwest vision quests. This all ties into the reductionist attitude concerning Native Americans found across not just Star Trek, but American media in general. And the specific episodes that deal with Chakotay's heritage are also a mixed bag. Some, like the Paradise Syndrome and How Sharper Than a Serpent's Tooth, remove agency from Native American peoples and hand it over to more all-powerful aliens. Other specific episodes continue to misrepresent Native culture entirely. While Chakotay is not perfect, he is a far cry better at Native American representation than Trek has ever attempted, and sometimes Trek writers seemingly know of the problems with representing Native Americans on screen. So, in closing, the social evolution that takes place for humanity in the Trek multiverse does not seem to have happened for some Native Americans. The reductionist problem seems to be on display across all Trek episodes and movies that deal with Native Americans, a practice at odds with Trek's theme of celebrating diversity. Star Trek continues to play on many native stereotypes, such as inferiority to civilized society, native roles as outsiders or opposites to civilization and as victims of that civilization, and the supposed spirituality of the Indian and how it's the opposite of civilized rationality, which writers at times purposely utilize. And of course, there's the white savior narrative. And I would be remiss not to mention that the Paradise Syndrome might be the most offensive episode of Star Trek on record. Trek wrestles with its representation of Native America, sometimes falling completely in line with what stereotypes general American media perpetuates, and a few times knowingly engaging those stereotypes. Generally, science fiction as a genre is a white, dominated space, and Trek stands out in its attempt to include outsiders to that space, even though it retains the perspective of the dominant American ethnic group. Thus concludes this episode of Trek's Please keep tabs on us for future installments, and thank you for watching.